All right, today we're going to talk about the spinocerebellar tracts. These are afferent sensory pathways that sense unconscious proprioception in the human body. So let's look at some details. All right, here's some actual cross sections of the spinal cord, and it's showing you where the spinocerebellar tracts lie. This is the lateral funiculus. There's the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. There's the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. The dorsal spinal cerebellar tract originates from a nucleus called Clark's nucleus, which exists between C8 and L2. We're also going to talk about the ventral spinal cerebellar tract, which actually originates in the intermediate gray matter of the spinal cord. And it relays information about interneuronal activity. So let's look at some details. All right, this drawing has um, three of the spinal cerebellar tracts on it, a cuneal spinal cerebellar tract, which we haven't talked about yet, but which is really just the rostral uh, extension of the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. All right, let's first look at the, the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. All right, first off, Muscle afferents from the caudal spinal cord levels reach Clark's nucleus via the fasciculus gracilis. Clark's nucleus only exists from L2 to C8. So any information coming in below L2, say from your big toe, has to come in and then travel up fasciculus gracilis. Remember that from the posterior columns? Travels up, 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 fasciculus gracilis, trying to find Clark's nucleus. It finds Clark's nucleus, and then the true dorsal spinal cerebellar tract comes from Clark's nucleus. These axons come out, they pile up in the lateral funiculus, and then they travel north. They use the inferior cerebellar peduncle in the medulla to find their way into the cerebellum. Uh, these will synapse mainly in the vermal or paravermal regions of the anterior and some of the posterior lobe of the cerebellum. If you cut the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, you're going to get ipsilateral signs. Typically cerebellar signs are ipsilateral, so you may get some ipsilateral ataxia. Now, as we noted, Clark's nucleus, the origin of the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract, only exists from C8 to L2. So how do we get this proper, unconscious proprioceptive information above C8? Well, what happens? Let's say something comes in from the upper extremity. Information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs comes in. There's no Clark nucleus, so it goes up and it seeks out another, another nucleus called the lateral cuneate or external cuneate nucleus. It's a nucleus that is just lateral to nucleus cuneatus. Gracilis, cuneatus, trigeminal complex, lateral cuneate nucleus. So it goes up, 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 synapses in the lateral cuneate nucleus. Then the Second order fibers come out, they join up with fibers of the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. They leap into the inferior cerebellar peduncle and they seek out the paravermal areas of the cerebellum. So in reality the cuneo cerebellar tract it contains the same information as the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract unconscious proprioception. You can be sleeping and your body knows where and what the state of your arm or your biceps are or is. It's unconscious proprioception. And we'll look at that in more detail in a second. The other tract here is the ventral spinal cerebellar tract and we mentioned it. It does not originate from the periphery so information is not coming in on the medial division of the dorsal root like it is for the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. Instead, all these millions and millions of little inner neurons 
in the spinal cord gray matter are sending information in to the cell bodies of the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. Second order fibers then come out, cross by the central canal to the other side and pile up below the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract in the lateral funiculus and continue up to find the superior cerebellar peduncle and then find their way into the cerebellum. What's unique here is the superior cerebellar peduncle is 99% an uh, efferent peduncle. Things are coming out of the superior cerebellar peduncle, mainly going to the red nucleus and the thalamus. But the ventral spinal cerebellar tract is the only afferent which uses this highway, the superior cerebellar peduncle. So that's an interesting fact. And note here that even though the ventral spinal cerebellar tract crosses the midline in the spinal cord, it recrosses in the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncle. So it's double crossed. So once again, in effect, cerebellar signs are ipsilateral. Now clinically, would you know if your ventral spinal cerebellar tract was cut? I don't think so. All right, let's look at more detail for the cuneo cerebellar tract. As I mentioned before, Clark's nucleus only exists from C8 to L3. There's a little gap and then the lateral cuneate nucleus kicks in. So embryologically, maybe once upon a time, Lucy had just one long nucleus and for some reason a gap formed. So you can think of this as one big long Clark's nucleus. But in reality, from L3 to C8, it's Clark's nucleus, and up in the medulla, it's the lateral cuneate nucleus. They're serving the same function. They're sampling information from muscle spindles, Golgi tendon organs, about unconscious proprioception. You know where your thumb is without thinking about it. And let's just go back here. This drawing it's the longitudinal section of the spinal cord, one side. And here you can see the dorsal spinal information comes in right here from a muscle spindle. This is a dorsal root ganglion. Travels up fasciculus cacillus, synapses in Clark's nucleus. This is between C8 and L3. The true dorsal spinal cerebellar tract then comes out of Clark's nucleus and travels in the lateral funiculus to pair of uh, to paravermal areas of the cerebellum via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now if we're above C8, spindle information, GTO information comes in and it travels in fasciculus cuneatus of the posterior columns because this is arm stuff, upper body stuff. It finds the lateral cuneate nucleus which then sends out fibers forming the cuneo cerebellar tract. These two tracts are in effect the same tract really, same information. But we're just trying to confuse you. Here's another drawing of the ventral spinal cerebellar tract. A simplified drawing just showing you how it comes out, it's sampling interneuronal activity, crosses the midline, piles up here, finds the superior cerebellar peduncle, crosses the midline again and goes into the cerebellum. For those of you that like words, Clark's nucleus only exists from C8 to L2. Muscle afferent spindle information below L3 uses fasciculus gracilis to get the Clark's nucleus. It's also known as nucleus dorsalis. The lateral cuneate nucleus picks up the slack in the medulla. Muscle info from the upper half of the body reaches the lateral or external cuneate nucleus by using the fasciculus cuneatus. And remember, the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract and the cuneo cerebellar tract use the inferior cerebellar peduncle. The ventral spinal cerebellar tract uses the superior cerebellar peduncle. It is double crossed. There's another tract called the rostral spinal cerebellar tract. Nobody cares about that. Cerebellar signs are ipsilateral. This is just a nice uh, slice through the lower medulla, see the fused baby feet. We have nucleus gracilis, nucleus cuneatus, the lateral cuneate nucleus, lateral 
to nucleus cuneatus. What is this nucleus? Extra points. That is the spinal tract and nucleus of five, the olive, the medial lumniscus, the hypoglossal nucleus, nucleus ambiguous, cortical spinal tract in the pyramids. By now you should be able to label these tracks. What are these two tracks collectively called? What is this one? What is this one? What are these two tracks? The dorsal one here and the ventral one here. And finally, it pains me to ask you this one, but what is the name of this track? Here are your answers. All right, a question, a board side question. A 10-year-old boy comes to the neurologist with weakness in his lower limbs, little or, little or no reflexes in his legs, a curvature to the spine, a slight like scoliosis, and an enlarged heart or heart problems. Upon testing with a tuning fork, it is found that he cannot sense vibration in his legs. His gait is ataxic and his voice is hoarse. I swear I have this. What is the diagnosis? Here's your choices. ALS, MS, VD, muscular dystrophy, Friedlich's ataxia. Let you think about that for a second. You can stop the video. Here's the answer. Is it ALS? Is it Lou Gehrig's disease? No, because cardiomyopathy and scoliosis would not be present in ALS. Also, dorsal column signs, that would be the vibration sense, would be normal in Lou Gehrig's disease. Remember that Lou Gehrig's disease is uh, cortical spinal tract and anterior horn cells. The diaphragm gets paralyzed and that can kill you. MS is an MS, multiple sclerosis, a scarring or a, uh, a buildup of plaques of the myelin in the body. Well, you wouldn't have heart problems or scoliosis with MS. MS would or can, could, could give you double vision and it would give you asymmetrical signs. So you could be weak on one side, not the other, etc. Is it VD, syphilis, etc.? Uh, VD would not account for the weakness, scoliosis, and heart problems. Syphilis would not affect the spinal cerebellar tracts or the cortical spinal tract. What tract is affected by syphilis? The posterior columns. Tabes dorsalis affects proprioception. Is it muscular dystrophy? No, because you wouldn't have any heart or spine issues with muscular dystrophy. The correct answer is uh, Frederick's ataxia, which is kind of a rare and strange disease that affects uh, the spinal cerebellar tracts, etc. Uh, sclerosis of the posterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord, characterized by muscular weakness and problems with the walking, abnormal gait, cerebellar signs. It occurs usually in children. And it has a genetic component, an autosomal recessive disease, usually of childhood onset. And you can have, it can wipe out the spinal cerebellars, the posterior columns, and even the cortical spinal tracts. It's a nasty thing. Some of the symptoms include uh, trouble walking, high arches, hoarse voice, scoliosis, tremor, kyphosis, straighten up. Congestive heart failure, secondary to cardiomyopathy, and weakness of the lower extremities. Most forms of this condition are associated with a mutation in the gene on chromosome 9, a band at Q13, and that codes for the mitochondrial protein, frataxin, which plays a role in eliminating iron from the mitochondria. Now here again are the symptoms. Difficult to walking, foot problems, involuntary bending or toe flexion, loss of reflexes, hammer toes, turning into the foot, muscle weakness, hoarse voice, slurred speech, tremor, kyphosis or scoliosis, involuntary eye movements, chest pain, shortness of breath, and you can have some heart issues. 
Prognosis. Usually after 15 to 20 years after the disease is first diagnosed, the person then becomes confined to a wheelchair and then totally incapacitated and these patients can die in early adulthood if there's heart complications. Some people with less severe symptoms can live longer. That's it. Thank you.